So yeah, as as he said, this church, you know, you guys were my biggest supporter. It was pretty amazing watching how God provides and provides above and beyond what you expect. This this church with your pancake fundraiser, you know, in one in one day, in one day my trip went from four from 40% funded, 40% of the estimated cost raised, to 100% funded one day because of you guys. But even then, God didn't stop because on Memorial Day weekend, I get a call from the missions director at church my dad used to pastor at in Wisconsin saying that they've got another donation for me as well. So, praise God for that. Just amazing. So, to start off, let's just read a little passage. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, if you want to follow along. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee in the mount, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. So this program, this trip that I went on, it's uh, part of a program called Volunteers in Actions. It's done through, an or through a uh, missions organization called WGM. And I was in the country for six weeks total, I left June 16th. I arrived back here in the States on July 28th. And basically what it's for, it's for people like me who want to go, but can't for whatever reason go full time. For me, it's because I'm still in college. And before I can go back full time, which is my ultimate goal and what I want to eventually do, I still have to finish one more year of college. So we figured this summer would be a good time to go there on a short-term basis and learn a little bit, see what exactly am I getting myself into. So there we go. Uh, in Japan, I actually worked with what is known as the Emanuel Wesleyan Federation. It, <laughs> uh, the Emanuel Wesleyan Federation is actually a three-way partnership between three different organizations that are all involved in missions in Japan. Uh, the first organization is Global Partners, which is, the, which is actually part of the Wesleyan denomination. Uh, it's the missions branch of their church. They've been present in the country since 1919. And they, in recent years, their <laughs> presence has waned a bit, but they're still there and they're still active. Uh, the second organization in this three-way partnership is the Emanuel General Mission, or IGM for short. Uh, IGM is a church denomination that was born there in Japan, which gives them a unique position for ministering to the Japanese people. It was founded by a law student turned theologian, David Tsutada. Uh, uh, he was imprisoned during the Second World War because of his refusal to recant his beliefs in Christ. And while he was in prison was when he drafted the idea for 
the IGM church and began working on it with the with help of other Christians shortly after his release at the end of the war. And it's now the largest denomination currently in Japan. And then the last organization is WGM, World Gospel Mission, the organization I technically went through. Uh, they started in the country in 1952 with two missionaries, uh, Dave and Edna Kuba, who wanted to go almost as soon as the Second World War was over, but it actually took them several years before they found an organization actually willing to support them. And then two years later, they formed this partnership and still to this day work together. So between the two organizations, they've got four missionaries or six full-time missionaries currently serving in the country. Uh, on the global partner side, there's Robin White, who uh, works specifically with one church in the city of Nagoya. And then there's Andrea Swarthout, which if you've heard my testimony before, I mentioned that I first felt God saying, I want you to go to Japan when our old church in Pennsylvania was visited by a missionary to the country who was in the process of raising her support. That's who Andrea is, that missionary who I first felt my call listening to her speak. Uh, then on the WGM side, we have Brandon Kuba, who is actually the grandson of the first missionaries WGM had on the field. Uh, Holly Mulheisen, and then Zach Motz and his wife Esther. Unfortunately, though, I actually only worked with these four on the top. Uh, Andrea is in a different city by herself, and the logistics just didn't work. And the Motts family, they're currently here in the States. So those four on the top, the, or the three on the top, those are the ones I actually worked with, Brandon, Holly, and Robin. So here's a picture I took when I first got to Tokyo. That was the first city I went to. Tokyo is currently the largest city in the world and has been for around 300 years at this point. Uh, total population in the city proper is about 37 million. Expand it to the whole metropolitan area, the suburbs and whatnot, it's closer to 60 million. So here's just to kind of give you an idea of how big of a city this is. This is a map of their railway systems. It's actually not the full map. If we had every single line and every single station, it'd be so crowded and loud, you probably wouldn't be able to tell. But point out a few things here. This little guy here, the uh, two squares are kind of connected. That's Shinjuku Station, the largest and busiest train station in the entire world. Up here in the corner is a train station we use most often, uh, Ikebukuro train station, which is the second business, biggest and busiest in the world. And then down here, Shibuya, third biggest and third busiest in the world. And this black line that goes through all three, it's called the Yamanote line. The Yamanote during morning rush hour from 7.30 to 8.30 when everyone's going to work, that one train line will carry more people in that one hour than the entire New York City train system will in an entire day. Just kind of give you an idea of how big a city it is. So this is the mission house that WGM has. Uh, it's where I stayed while I was there. It's the main property for them. Uh, while we were, while I was there, some time was spent learning about the culture and experiencing Japanese things. Other time was spent observing and participating in ministries and learning what does ministry look like in Japan. So this comes from some of our uh, exploring Japanese culture. Uh, for the Japanese, the two the two main religions for them are Shintoism and Buddhism. 
99% uh, of the people who live there are a member of one of the two religions. So here are from some of the Shinto and Buddhist places we visited. The bottom two are from uh, Buddhist temples where we went to learn, okay, what do the people already believe? Where is it that they're coming from when we go to minister to them? And then the top two are from a Shinto shrine. Uh, one of the easiest ways to tell the difference is the gate you see up there in the corner, which marks that you're entering the outer courts of the Shinto shrine. Then you've got the holy place, which people go to to pray and to leave offerings, which are usually money, though sometimes food. I even once heard a story of someone offering at a Shinto shrine a McDonald's quarter pounder. So it can be quite a wider range of things. And then beyond that's the really holy place where only the priests are able to go. But that's the basic setup. Uh, we also spent some time visiting different museums. This one's from the Tokyo Edo Museum, which a little, little bit of history on Japan and the city of Tokyo. Uh, Japan during the 12th century was kind of civil war all over the whole country. And there came a series of three seceding generals who kind of brought an end to it and brought it back under their control. And when they did that, they let the emperor stay, uh, but the last of these three generals set himself up in charge of the entire army and the entire financial system and gave himself the title Shogun, which began a period of time in Japan's history where there were actually two capital cities, the emperor's capital in the west and the shogun's capital, the city of Edo in the east. And even though the emperor still existed, the shogun was the one who really had all the power. Well, during the 15th century, when Europe started going out to Asia to get the spices and things to bring back to make a profit in Europe, uh, Japan saw them also colonizing some of these countries they were visiting, like China, and said, well, we don't really want that to happen to our country. So they shut the borders. And when that happened, if you were outside of Japan, didn't matter if you were Japanese or not, if you were outside the country, you were not allowed in. And if you were in the country and you were Japanese and had not accepted any foreign ideas, you were good, but you couldn't leave the country. But if you were a foreigner or you had accepted foreign ideas, which would include the entire Christian population of Japan at the time, they killed you. Uh, there's actually a memorial in Japan. I didn't get a chance to go see it, but there's a memorial that commemorates 1,500 Christians who were all crucified together because of their refusal to recant their faith. Uh, and this continued until about 1853 when the United States decided, well, we're tired of waiting for Japan to reopen their borders. And so the president sent Commodore Perry, who led a fleet of then state-of-the-art battleships through the blockade into the bay and basically reduced everything in Edo along the seafront to rubble and then demanded the shogun reopen the borders and begin trading with the rest of the world again. And unfortunately, he didn't really have much of a choice because Japan militaristically had not changed since the shoguns first rose to power. Uh, this led to what became known as the Meiji Restoration, where the shogun was kicked out the emperor put back into power, and the emperor at that point left his old capital, which came to be known as Kyoto, which means the western capital, and took up the shogun's capital in Edo, which was renamed Tokyo, which means the eastern capital. But that also brings me, though, to one of the challenges 
that the Christian church faces in Japan, and that is throughout Japan's history, there have been three big waves of missionaries. And each of these three waves was made possible because of some kind of foreign military action, be it justified or unjustified, the invasion of Commodore Perry being the second of these three waves. As a result, many of the Japanese people view Christianity as something they never really wanted in their country to begin with, but were forced to let into their country basically at gunpoint. So, a few pictures. That last one was a diagram of Tokyo as it would have looked like back during the time of the shoguns. This is another picture I took. The uh, Japanese in Tokyo back then had a very, for that time, very well-developed firefighting system, and this is a standard that the lead firefighter would carry to let everyone know, hey, the firefighters are coming to try and stop the fire. So, and this, this here is from the uh, 1964 Olympics. Uh, the city of Tokyo, during the World War, was basically burned to the ground through firebombing, and a little-known fact more people were actually killed in Tokyo than in any other city in Japan, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where we dropped the atomic bombs. So this, this here was kind of Japan's, Japan's time to say, we've come back, we've bounced back, we got destroyed, but we've bounced back. So, a little trivia question, I know my family knows the answers, so, but... 1964 was the last time Tokyo hosted the Olympics. When will be the next time? Does anyone know? 2020. So it's coming. And this co these are some from, from one of the other museums we visited uh, where they took some of the buildings that remain from Japan's past and restored them Ah, in this outdoor museum. And here comes some samples of art that I found. And we also took a trip down to the Bay Area to view it. That was pretty fun. This picture was taken from Shinjuku Observatory. It's the uh, building that the Tokyo City government is located in. And at the top, they have a place you can go up for free, overlook the entire city. Uh, unfortunately, we went on a day that was kind of hazy, but if you went on a day that was clear, right around here you'd be able to see Mount Fuji, had it been clear. So, and then, Tokyo was the first place I visited. Nagoya, where Robin is, was the second place I visited. Uh, this is probably the most famous site in the city of Nagoya, the Nagoya Castle. Uh, it's been around since the 12, 1300s. Uh, most of it has been rebuilt over the years. This here is the outer wall and moat. This is one of the few places that has never been rebuilt. It's the exact same as it was when it was first, or same structure as it was when it was first built. Obviously there was water going through the moats back then. And then the main keep of the castle and an old, an old well, like what they would have had back when the castle was in its heyday. And this, this is inside the palace where the family would have actually lived. This is completely rebuilt. It was totally destroyed during the Second World War, but they rebuilt it, remade it to look like it would have back then. This is also a statue of a samurai who uh, went to a shrine to pray before going into battle, won the battle and donated this as kind of his way of saying thank you. And we also got to see a demonstration of the making of a Japanese sword. Uh, we came towards the end of the process when the artist was kind of signing his work and preparing to put the handle on. But that was pretty neat, getting to see how they would have made it. 
and the Goya TV tower. Don't ask me why it's famous. It's famous. I don't know. Ah, and while we were there, uh, this is Robin over here in the corner. He was doing a big selfie group photo. But uh, we got invited by one of his English students to do karaoke, and that's us. And then on my last night in Nagoya, we also had a sushi party. Again, Robin doing the selfie thing. Uh, a few other people to point out. Uh, Uchiyama Sensei, he was the uh, pastor of the church that we worked with in Nagoya. Uh, then back here behind me, that would be his wife, Noriko. And Ryoko, who's kind of the church's secretary slash business manager, those were probably the people, them and of course Robin there in the corner, were probably the people I worked most directly with while I was in Nagoya. So focusing some on the ministry side, that, you know, that was fun getting to experience the culture, but the ministry is what's really important. Uh, in Tokyo, we went and visited a different church every week. Uh, churches I visited, there was uh, Nakameguro, uh, Fukugawa, which this is a picture of their sanctuary, the Fukugawa Church. There was the Itibashi Church, BTC. We visited a Free Methodist Church. So we visited churches. Uh, we also, there are also uh, about five different Bible studies, I think, that the uh, WGM missionaries do that I visit, that I observe. This was actually a woman's Bible study that Holly leads that I got to watch and observe. Other Bible studies, there's uh, one Holly does at a free Methodist church that I got to look at where they were going through the Exodus. Uh, then Brandon, the uh, other WGM missionary I showed on the earlier slide, uh, he leads two at a local college called Rikyo University, uh, one in English, one in Japanese. And he also leads a Bible study at Nakameguro Church. So yeah, we got to observe Bible studies. And then Holly also does an English class for kids. Uh, in Japan, learning English as a second language is very, very popular. That popularity has just gone up in recent years because of the Olympics. Because in four years, they're going to be having all these foreigners come to participate in the Olympic sports. They want to be prepared for it. So this, create, this actually creates a big opportunity for missionaries in Japan to teach English and to begin making these connections. Uh, this, again, is from her kids' program called Fun Fun English. And I actually have a pretty funny story for you. This, this picture was taken by the wife of that church's pastor, who is also named Noriko. It's a very popular name for Japanese women, Noriko. And one of them was, uh, she had posted, it really trans, she had posted in Japanese. It really translates to, Drake was very helpful today, but Google Translate, it's not the most reliable thing in the world. And Japanese to English is one of the worst pairs of languages. So she posts that picture, tags me in it, and my dad sees it on Facebook. And he hits the C translation button and it comes up, Drake is full, please help. So he posted a very confused comment, and we had to explain that Google Translate did not translate well. So, so then this, this here's in Nagoya now. Uh, this Robin in, in Nagoya, Robin also teaches English. She has... Uh, three classes for adults and one for kids. Uh, this picture was taken from the uh, Wednesday morning 
class, I believe. Again, Noriko, the pastor's wife, and Ryoko were in that class. Uh, I even got an opportunity to teach two of two different sessions, uh, one for the Saturday morning class and one for the kids' class. So here's me teaching the kids' class for a Sunday, which you really can't tell in this picture, but that particular day I was wearing a shirt I had bought at a store in Tokyo for that comes from a Japanese TV show called Dragon Ball Z. And the kids saw that and they just absolutely loved it. They just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So yeah, teaching another class for kids. Uh, we also had a annual event called the Summer Festival for the kids program. And these are the five of us who helped out the program. Well, Uchiyama Sensei also helped out. He was the one taking the picture. So we've got, we've all got our traditional Japanese festival clothes on. Uh, there's the jimbei, which is what I'm wearing. The kimono, which is what Noriko's wearing. And the yukata, which is what everyone else is wearing. So, and I also, I also got a chance to speak a couple different times at the church. Nothing real big, but this is me getting a chance to share my testimony and why do I want to be in Japan? Why did I choose Japan? So, and then also uh, Robin is very well connected with the missionary community in Nagoya. So I got a chance to meet a few other missionaries and see what they're doing. Uh, two such missionaries, they work together, Creed and Ian, who are in campus ministries. They focus mainly on college students. Uh, this here is actually the campus of one of the colleges I visited with Creed. Uh, it's really just these two buildings. Granted, they're about 10, 11 stories tall, but one big difference between Japanese colleges and American colleges Japanese colleges, everyone commutes. No one lives on campus, everyone's a commuter. So no need for dormitories. And another missionary I was introduced to was a guy named Kurt. Uh, this here is from his homeless ministry. Uh, what, what he does is twice a month, he'll set up here in the park and have a message for the people and then hand out at the end bentos which are basically pre-prepared lunches that come in a plastic box thing so they'll come they'll hear the message and then they'll get a dinner and uh it's actually done pretty well for him so, what are some of the challenges that are faced in Japan? So, lack of knowledge and workers. Uh, knowledge of Christianity and what Christians teach is very scarce in Japan. Uh, for example, one story I heard while I was there. Uh, it was December, and a pastor was setting up a Christmas display outside of his church. And a lady's walking by, sees him setting up the display and goes, oh, I didn't realize you Christians celebrated Christmas as well. But that's just an example of how little they actually know. And they're just not very many workers. As I already said, 99% of the Japanese population is either Shinto or Buddhist. That leaves 1% everyone else. So that 1% includes the Christians, but also includes the Hindus, the Muslims, the atheists, the whatever other religion you can think of that may or may not be present in Japan. So there's just not a whole lot of people. And missionaries... As I said, there have been three major waves, the most recent being at the end of the Second World War. While that generation is growing old, they're retiring, and there are just not a lot of younger missionaries 
who are coming in and taking their place. So that's one of the challenges and one of the prayer requests, I would guess, that God send more workers to help with the field. Uh, cultural differences. This is going to be something you'll run into anywhere you go. There are, cult there are different things that, are, that can maybe be taken differently. Uh, for example, you know, here in the United States, someone does this, that means, you know, come here, come, come here. But you do this in Japan, that kind of be like flipping the bird in the United States. You want someone to come here, you do this. Some more significant cultural differences that affect uh, ministry in Japan. Uh, Japan is, the United States is a very individualized culture. It's all about the individual. Japan, on the other hand, is about is a clan culture. In Japanese culture, you're part of a community, and you always do what's in the community's interest. As a result, having your own opinions and expressing your own opinions and expressing your own ideas and going against the group, while that is admired here in the States, it is very frowned upon in Japan. In fact, the Japanese have an expression, the nail that sticks out gets hammered. And being a Christian in Japan means being the nail that sticks out. It means going against that flow, breaking out of that culture, and doing something that is not popular on the community level. So as hard as it, could, as hard as it can be to become a Christian here in the States, it's even harder in Japan because you have to go against that group culture. And it also affects the teaching methods you can use. I know for me personally, one challenge is that when I'm teaching, I love using the discussion style teaching where you have a question and the group discusses it. Japan, that doesn't really work because... What, you want my, you want my opinion? Oh, um, well, you know... It, sharing your opinion just is very frowned upon. So, another challenge, the Japanese view on religion and Christianity. Uh, Japanese people view, take religion a bit differently than we do here in the States. Uh, here in Western societies, we believe there is such thing as a right and a wrong answer, and you participate in a religion because you believe it is the truth. The Japanese people, most of them really deep down inside, to be completely honest, are atheists. But they view religion as a, and participation in religion as a matter of loyalty to one's culture. So they're Shintoist or Buddhist, not because they really believe that, but because being Shinto or being Buddhist is the Japanese thing to do. As a result, ministering to Japanese people as an American, it's very possible to get a response from them like, well, of course you're, an, you're Christian. You're American, and America is a Christian culture. Therefore, since you're American, it is your duty to your culture to be a Christian. But I'm Japanese. Japan is a Shinto and a Buddhist culture. Therefore, I have a duty to my culture to be Shinto or Buddhist. Furthermore, a problem that they face is religious synchronization, trying to participate in multiple different religions all together at once. For example, you might have someone who Sunday morning is you know, praising God, reading the Bible, and then after church, stops by the local Shinto shrine to pray to the Shinto gods, and then after dinner is praying at their family's Buddhist altar. And while the pastors understand that this is an issue, a lot of the everyday people see it as, how can this possibly be an issue? I'm trying to get as many different gods on my side as I can. And the view on Christianity. As I said before, they view Christianity as something they were basically forced 
at gunpoint to let into their country. But it goes a little bit deeper than that. Uh, back in the 90s, all right, this red line right here, that's the Marinochi subway line. Back in the 90s, uh, religious, religious extremists planted nerve gas bombs on that subway line and set them off in the middle of rush hour. Uh, for the Japanese people, that's kind of their 9-11. And because of this and similar shenanigans, many of the Japanese people look at Christianity much the same way we would look at radical Islamic groups like ISIS. So not only are we working against lack of information, lack of workers, a very different religious view, we're also fighting against a lot of negative stereotypes and suspicion and mistrust. Uh, another challenge, uh, Hone Tototane, that's translated, that's basically inside face, outside face. It's a matter of, an element of Japanese culture where no matter how they really feel about you, on the outside they're always going to be smiling and friendly. So they could absolutely love you and be overjoyed every time they see you, and they'll smile and be polite and, oh yeah, it's so great to meet you. Or they could absolutely hate you and want to just put you in front of a speeding train. And when you see them, they'll smile, be polite, oh, hey, it's so nice to see you. Which kind of makes it a little challenging uh, figuring out where you stand with them. And Japan is a nearly crimeless society. Uh, to be honest, you could lose your wallet in the middle of downtown Tokyo not realize it for three days and go back and it'll either still be sitting where it was undisturbed or in the nearest police lost and found. And you may be thinking, how could this be a problem? Well, it makes it a little bit difficult sometimes for uh, Japanese people to realize their need for a savior. Uh, you pull out a verse like, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, you might get a reaction like, well, apparently that whoever wrote that has never been to Japan because we Japanese people, we don't do those kinds of bad things. We don't cheat. We don't steal. Now, challenges, yes. But ministry, still possible. Uh, as the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's just with the Japanese people, with the Japanese culture, it's just harder and slower. Uh, what we have found is that the most effective way to minister is to establish relationships, build into those relationships, and wait for them to start asking questions. As a result, this is a very long process. Uh, for example, WGM's original missionaries, the Kubas, they were there in the country 10 years before they saw anyone except Christ. So, difficult, yes, but not impossible. And that's why we do things like teaching English as a second language or Bible studies. It's all about getting non-Christians and Christians connected so that we can begin that process of building the relationships that will hopefully eventually lead to someone accepting Christ. So that's pretty much what I did I'll hand it back over to my dad now. Uh, thank you for indulging me and listening a little bit, and I look forward to working with you guys more.